it's wonderful to be here. Uh, let me start uh, sharing screen. Just kidding. Okay, so my screen is visible, right? And it moves. Very good. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about logic in school mathematics, very little in logic in the university, and a bit of what is logic and what logic can offer. So first, let me thank Shaji for this opportunity to speak on this topic today. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to meet uh, KSSP friends, even online. And uh, I have so many of my very dear KSSP friends here today whom I'm seeing after a long time. I can't say seeing. I do hope I can see a few faces at least, so I don't talk only to my laptop. Um, I, I should mention that it was Shaji who actually introduced me to the People's Science Movement. He was a PhD student of IMSC when I just joined. And in fact, in my very first, uh, uh, let me say, encounter with People's Science Movement was an invitation essentially organized by Shaji and T.R. Gondrajan, introduced, asking me to speak on Girdle's incompleteness theorem. Okay. And uh, so I went there, and there were six people, and I was really surprised that on a Sunday afternoon, some six people had come to listen to Gerdel's incompleteness theorem. And interestingly, Shaji today also asked me for whether I can talk on Gerdel's theorem. But I said, you know, I want to talk on this because this is something that uh, uh, on logic day about, uh, especially since I connect with mathematics and mathematics teachers in Kerala all the time, I thought I should talk about this. especially. So Gerdel's theorem another time, Shaji. So, um, yeah, I thank uh, Jayashree of Pomi Baba Center for a lot of the research in math education that I referred to here, and Janaki Ghosh of LSR Delhi for discussions on this topic. So, if there are comments and questions for which we don't have time to discuss today, my email address is here. You're welcome to write to me, and uh, we can carry on a discussion back if it's not possible today. Okay, I'm I wish I could speak in Malayalam. I can understand a little bit of Malayalam. So if you want to interject something in Malayalam, feel free. There will always be people to translate as well. And uh, so, yeah. So don't worry about interruptions. It's OK. OK, so this is a, a quite a famous painting, actually. And uh, it's a girl standing at the window and looking inside pensively. And this is my picture of logic as far as school mathematics is concerned. In some sense, Logic is there, but it's sitting outside and looking into the school curriculum. And uh, so here is a quote from Lewis Carroll through the looking glass. And he says, I know what you're thinking about, but it isn't so, no how. Contrary wise, if it were so, it might be. And if it were so, it would be. But as it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. So, I mean, what is logic is, uh, you know, I'm not going to define logic and for me all this. And uh, uh, sharing is reverse, says Shastri. Uh, are there other people who have any problem? I think otherwise, no, Shastri, no, sir, you may no, have sir. to. No, sir, it's okay. No, yeah. sir, fine. So I think you may have to leave and rejoin, and uh, yeah, might be okay. Google Meet sometimes does that. Okay, here's a question. The, here's a problem that you find in many textbooks. I have actually pulled it out of a textbook. Evaluate x squared minus 1 by x minus 1 at x equal to 1. Varun, who knows that x, x squared minus 1 is x plus 1 mi times x minus 1, says, yeah, I mean, so it's x plus 1 times x minus 1 divided by x minus 1. Therefore, x plus 1 evaluated 2 at 1, you get answer 2. But then he's told that the answer is wrong. Because if you put x equal to 1, you are dividing by 0. And that doesn't make sense, right? So he can see that the expression is indeterminate when evaluated at x equal to 1. Now, then, therefore, Varun learns that after any derivation, he should substitute and check. Okay. So these are all conversations with actual school children that I'm having. Yeah, you know, we're supposed to substitute and verify, right? And we teach this, you know. I'm sure math teachers will agree with me. This is how we teach. Varun cannot see what went wrong with this simplification. I mean, you do the simplification all the time, and suddenly you are told that this is wrong because you know 
x minus 1 is sitting in the denominator and you can't evaluate it at x equal to 1. What's going on? As Varun moves up to higher secondary classes, he relies more and more on simplification of algebraic okay. In some sense, the life of a secondary and higher secondary student, as far as mathematics is concerned, is algebraic simplification. That's what you do most of the time. I am sure, you know, children who are struggling through 10th, 11th, 12th would agree with me. And he encounters in limits in class 11. Now he is told to evaluate limit extending to 1, x squared minus 1 by x minus 1. Now, and then he's suspicious, he's once bitten, twice shy, right? I mean, but now he learns that you should try substitution first. And when it does not work, you should simplify. This is what, in fact, if you look at uh, class 11 textbooks, you know, you'll find something like this book. And this is a standard strategy that class 11 children use. Varun accepts that the limit exists. It is two and moves on. But he is acutely uncomfortable. Something is wrong with this whole business, right? The math classroom rarely acknowledges Varun's discomfort as legitimate. In fact, at this point, if you don't feel uncomfortable, something is wrong. You are not really questioning mathematics as you are learning it. Otherwise, if you are just uh, accepting whatever you are told at this point, you are not thinking through. In fact, I would say that you are missing some very important element of logic. What was wrong with evaluating it at, at x equal to 1? And what is OK about talking about limit extending to 1? And this difference is very crucial. And if you don't really understand it, you know, limits are going to create a problem. And calculus is waiting for you to create all kinds of problems. And this is the thing about logic in school mathematics. right? And I think this kind of discomfort, as I said, I call it legitimate. It's legal. We have to accept it. In fact, we have to discuss with students you know whether they are confused or not and if they are not confused why are they not confused right now what are the content areas among the content areas of mathematics which one involves logic most i usually ask this unfortunately this is an online thing usually i do it with school teachers and i take a vote and ask how many people think number systems is most algebra geometry trigonometry calculus probability statistics these are all the content areas and you know, and it doesn't matter with college teachers as well, you can discuss. And usually when I do this, almost all workshops, geometry is the one that wins most. Because geometry is the one that has really maximum logic. Because there are proofs, there are theorems, proofs, and so on. Other things, you know. So that's why I thought, of course, it's true that. But I would like to say that that's not the point. Everything has logic, right? And uh, But what? how do you tease out the logic that is there? So I'm going to take only examples from algebra today, because that is the one that usually teachers say has least amount of logic. And if that is so, that's a tragedy. Okay, there are some hands, but I'm not going to look at that. Now, reasoning in the school curriculum, if you look at uh, class 11 textbook of NCRT, there is a chapter called mathematics, mathematical reasoning. And it introduces students to propositional logic, basically Boolean logic. And chapter 14 is the one. There is one section on statements, one on combined statements, and then use special words like and and or. So logic is about saying P and Q. And then there is a whole section on implication. And with special emphasis on if when you go from P implies Q, Q implies P is the converse. Not Q implies not P is the contrapositive. You have all these things. And you have one section on validating statements. Basically, how do you validate whether a statement is true or not? Now, interestingly, the text principally focus, focuses on the language of propositional logic. This is what logicians would call propositional logic, where you have sentences which you combine using and, or, not, implies, etc. And if and only if, things of this kind. And there is a lot of text devoted to formalizing statements in English or Tamil or Hindi or whatever into the language of propositional logic. The section on evaluating statements actually offers three methods of evaluation. You have direct evaluation, whether it's true or false, contradiction, and contrapositive. And the 
contradiction i i find that many students have a problem what does it mean you know proof by contradiction and what is the difference between con contradiction and contrapositive and you know very often you say suppose not and students say what do you mean suppose not i mean you are trying to say it's true how can you suppose it is not true and so on. right and these are very legitimate concerns there is an emphasis on saying that even a single counter example can invalidate a statement in contrast to if you want to validate a statement you can't just give a whole lot of examples even a whole lot of examples will not work you need a proof is all very good i'm not saying it's bad but then this chapter follows the one on limits and derivatives right consider the very you know if i just take the ncrt textbook and take the last two exercises right La, you know just take the last exercises of the two chapters chapter 13 which is find the derivative of x by sin to the nx not even sin squared x huh? sin to the nx where n is variable okay 344 it says write the following statement in five different ways conveying the same meaning if a triangle is equiangular then it is an obtuse angle triangle now which do you think a, state, a student is going to take seriously right come on if you are a class 11 student and if you are going to spend your time writing five different ways of this thing which looks like something that you learnt in class 7 are you going to take that seriously look at the difficulty of this statement find the derivative of x by sin n to the sin to the nx right which is you know so no wonder nobody takes logic seriously in class 11 at all right and i am very happy that it's there in fact all teacher students welcome logic because it's very easy to get five marks out of that all board exams will have at least five marks and i am very happy for anything that where students can get easy five marks at 10 marks especially when they are going to be sitting and calculating derivatives and limits but if this is what logic is about obviously no one gives a damn about logic right i mean writing in five different ways is definitely not the most interesting thing to do right now which is taken more seriously by teachers and students obviously not right when you are sitting and calculating limits and derivatives something like this seems like you know uh, childish stuff and a waste of time and what is very interesting is class 10 and class 12 textbooks have appendices titled proofs in mathematics and they give examples of deductive reasoning they illustrate case analysis proof by contradiction and also a very interesting section on mathematical induction most of the examples come from number theory or geometry not calculus which is the major concern of 11th and 12th now why am i saying this by the way i was very much part of that discussion in ncert in the mid 2000s um, and uh, ncert i must also say that i know that ncert textbooks when they were written these were actually main chapters but there is a big uh, this thing with cbsc and cbsc said no you know this is not going to work teaching this will be hard exams will be hard finally it was moved to appendices now of course once it is an appendices what is the signal it means that you are not going to ask question in board exam and of course nobody then bothers about it right this is some kind of an equilibrium where everybody is happy i mean you it's important so you it's not that you can't say it's not there in the book it is there in the book but it is there in the appendices and of course you know what happens we know what about in the university right there are i mean cpr is here right there are great math teachers here that i know cp narayanan is here ramchandran is here now ugc math curricula right um if you look at the there are two major documents one is 2015 and the other one is 2019 the first one talks of logic mainly in the context of reason reasoning critical thinking etc the latter actually includes an elective course in mathematical logic this is a very fairly recent you know it came out only during you know just when the pandemic started i don't know how much uh, it has actually been even looked at by university none of the core courses include any logic component especially if you look at real analysis there is some bit of set theory not very much mathematical logic computer science graduate schools include a course in logic but that's only in uh, a few iits um, nit suratkal has i know uh, i mean nit calicut has uh, an electric course in logic i know i know logic teachers there um, there are a few places that i see here and there but generally i don't see very much now the question is how much doing an elective course in logic help a mathematics student i don't see any rational spelt out in any math curriculum document 
computer science curricula that include logic do spell out applications of logic in system design and verification, in databases and artificial intelligence. It's a mention. Training in formal logic used to be considered indispensable for discipline programming uh, in the 90s, especially 80s and 90s. By after, uh, I think, 20th, 21st century, much of this has gone down. Um, very few institutions follow that whole Dijkstra, uh, David Gree's style of uh, teaching programming these days. So we will not talk about logic in the university at all. Um, what about logic for school mathematics? What's really the relevance? Is there such a thing as a logic of school mathematics? EPS, should it be taught in school? Now, my answer is mainly that mathematical logic can clarify many problematic issues in school mathematics. For example, Varun's conundrum that I mentioned. In fact, I think this is the best use of logic. In fact, most importantly, here I want to mention that it can help teachers understand the unity of mathematical thought, not only between high school and the university, but also within school mathematics between algebra and geometry, for instance, and number theory. Um, so what is logic? What do we have in mind when we talk about logic? The language of propositional or predicate logic? Predicate logic is the language of mathematics in general, when you use for all x and there exists y, and so on, right? And what about formal proofs, reasoning, what kind? Mathematical induction, uh, deductive reasoning, industrial reasoning probabilistic reasoning, argumentation. This is something we don't talk about at all. And, uh, in NCF 2005, there is some importance given to the notion of argument within mathematics as a process, as opposed to proof. Proof is very different from argument. And we don't really discuss that much. Or is it something else altogether? No. OK, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do this exercise. You know, if you write down a deductive proof, right? Right? Base angles of an isosceles triangle are equal. Now, if you're going to write a proof like this, does the language of propositional logic, writing and, or, implies, and so on, does it actually help you do such proofs? Do we gain by writing down a formal proof indicating axioms, step numbers, and rule names? I mean, that's what the class 11 NCRT textbook chapter 13 would have you believe. I clearly not. Yeah. If this were the only use of formal logic in school mathematics, it's best to leave it outside and say, don't even come to the window. right? Perhaps we can settle for informal proofs when extracting formal proofs from them is OK. Maybe a teacher should say, OK, write informal proof, but from there I can get a formal proof if I want. But that's not easy. I mean, consider the proof that the two, sum of two odd numbers is even. Now, in primary school, we draw pictures of the two odd numbers, right? I mean, in fact, that's the best way to teach it in primary school. Because odd numbers, you when you start pairing up, always one is left alone. You take two pictures, both consisting of a lot of pairs, and one left alone in each of them. And then when you put them together, that also is a pair, and that's it. Actually, this helps in understanding. I think this is a much better proof. In middle school, you write the two numbers as 2a plus 1 and 2b plus 1, add them, and then you realize that it's 2 times a plus b plus 2, and therefore it is even. I'm not sure that learning this step, oh, my thing is gone. Yeah. It is OK? Something else uh, has come up. Uh, somebody else is presenting. You, if you yeah. present once again, it will be okay, I think. Okay. Has it come back? Uh, yes. Yes, it's okay. Okay. Yeah. So now, which proof is more understandable? Right? The latter is a deduction, but it is informal. And extracting a formal derivation is not easy. Yeah, okay. So um, is the on 
now it's on yes sir yes okay so george polia talks about three things and i think all these are important for math teachers demonstration deduction and derivation now very often what we do are demonstrations not uh, deduction and derivation right a proof provides both justification and explanation now a derivation in a formal system produces only justification it doesn't explain anything right a demonstration i mean going back all the way to aristotle is a deduction where premises are known to be true and a demonstration is supposed to produce knowledge now we should seriously consider the use of theorem prover technology and tools for derivations especially in undergraduate classes in my opinion and liberate logic to use the other two d's right logic is not about doing a you know bureaucratic formal proof right and because that doesn't explain anything and what we want to really is to ask is it true when is it true right truth is a very important thing after all right and we can use computer algebra systems but we don't really think of use of logic tools and i think that can be very important and useful as we go along now i think explicating these distin distinctions is very impo important for mathematics education demonstration has a very strong pedagogic purpose but when is it inadequate when do we insist on proof and who should provide the proof the student the teacher or the textbook in which cases should you ask the student to produce the proof when is it that the teacher produces the proof and student verify the proof when is it that you simply take the proof from the textbook and uh, demonstrate what is going on to students and i think these are you know good questions to discuss among ourselves as math teachers when do we insist on a formal derivation and really what are the implications for teacher knowledge and i think that's what i'm coming to me right? there is extensive literature on students reasoning and structure and proofs for me the leading light in all this is always fordenthal anna miyazaki tall weber javelier spirit very very good uh, uh, things i can give you references for anybody interested on one side we have formal proof systems with arcane unmotivated rules that do not lead to natural proofs on the other side discussions on mathematical reasoning which concentrate on intuition and design formal proofs both are right and both miss the point the first one is about derivation the second one is about truth the major theorems of logic justify the relationship between the two and on world logic day i would like to say that understanding logic you know studying logic is well worth it mainly because it shows you the relationship between proof and truth right and somehow when we talk as if both are the same thing we miss the point and uh, children are left confused in the whole process now logic certainly has to do with reasoning but it is much more and in ways that are actually useful for mathematics learning logic is a language for pro expressing properties of interest and makes us conscious of our vocabulary the syntax semantics distinction in logic helps clear many ambiguities logic shows the connection between assertion and procedures for checking them which is of central interest to the learner i'll give some examples logic is also a way of studying limitations of reasoning methods but of course school curricula do not address this issue nor do undergraduate curricula in fact especially in analysis you know the teachers of analysis i'm sure agree with me on this that there are many many methods in analysis real analysis that we teach in analysis courses or calculus courses but we rarely discuss the limitations of these and uh, that becomes very important for instance when you do physics and when you do formal reasoning in physics um what logic can offer now children learn in middle school that we use letters always x x is a the unknown right to denote unknown numbers now this is what we mean by asking them to solve something like x plus 3 equal to 5 now in when you see x plus 3 equal to y x is one number it's an unknown number and you are trying to find out what that x is but when we move to x plus y equals 5 x is again a single unknown number but it can denote many possible values already you have a bit of a problem right it's a single unknown number it's it's not actually at the same time equal to 1 as well as equal to 2 right 
but when x equal to 1 y equal to 4 when x equal to 2 y equal to 3 and so on right so there is a difference here and then when we write x plus y equals y plus x x can be any number whatsoever right and if you think that middle school children are not confused about it a either those still children are not thinking or we are not letting them think that is the problem thinking children are actually confused about all these things and we don't recognize their confusion as important and legitimate in fact at this point we want confused children right so that we can clarify if on the other hand they do not question this at all there is all the critical thinking that we keep talking about right somehow when it comes to science education we talk a lot about critical thinking i mean in people science movement it's very common mathematical thinking in mathematics somehow critical thinking is supposed to be part of it. but it's not true as like and i'm trying to demonstrate and this is a huge puzzle for many children consider the line x equal to k where k is a constant a constant that can be any number this is bizarre you know i have seen many many children asked to draw graph of x equal to 3 right okay makes sense huh? um and that's parallel to y axis okay that's also fine what about uh, x equal to k where k is a constant no this sort of puzzles that uh, you know children in secondary school have the use of quantifiers and careful use of free variables by us not necessarily by children can clarify things easily what's a polynomial students often don't distinguish between px y equal to px and px equal to 0 right i mean very often we just say x squared plus uh, 5x plus 6 sometimes we write y equals x squared plus 5x plus 6 sometimes we write x squared plus 5x plus 6 equal to 0 what are polynomials we ask students to factor and expand them so they are expressions we ask students to graph them so they are functions we ask students to find their roots so they are equations very rarely do we say find solve the equation x squared plus 5x plus 6 equal to 0 very often we simply say find the roots of x squared plus 5x plus 6 and i'll show you any number of textbooks different boards different places where such things are there what is the mathematical answer to this it's neither an expression nor a function it's an element of a ring there are many expressions for it it's not a function what is the pedagogical answer for it it's both an expression and a function depending on the context and the level of the student and that is the honest answer which as mathematics teachers we rarely discuss we rarely actually talk about when is it who is it for why are we doing it this way we need good translations between the two i call it mapping the terrain we need to map the curriculum and and a training in logic i think can help the educator immensely in this regard here is a lesson working with some child in class 10 board examinations uh, yeah this was pre pre i think right Okay, so, and this is, by the way, a uh, actual board examination question no? from I from ICSE board. I don't remember which year. So you are supposed to solve. I mean, you are supposed to do it. Two huh? sine x minus two root three cos six minus root three tan x plus three. Shaji, you have to be a class ten student to sit and solve such things, right? Why would you solve something like this? Okay. Now Preeti took two minutes, and she said x equal to thirty degrees. When I asked her how did she get it, I mean, come on, you can't get this answer in two minutes, right? She said, "Ha, huh, you know, board exam questions invariably the answer is 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, right?" So she tried 30, and it works. So, and she said, "LHS evaluation zero. Is this okay?" I'm sure there are any number of math teachers sitting here. Many of them actually evaluate board exam things. He pretty actually wrote that. I substitute in thirty and I get zero equal zero. Therefore, it's the solution. Would they give the marks? No way. Now I insisted, and I told her, "Look, you have to do the derivation." And she tried to manipulate the LHS, and she made mistakes. Now she reminded me I had taught her to substitute the end result and verify. You remember Varun? We when we said you are always supposed to substitute and verify. That is the golden rule. to make sure there are no mistakes then she asked right 
Now, if the substitution had to be done anyway, why not try it at first? This seems like common sense, right? So Preeti asked, I should not substitute first and get the answer easily, but then must try to do so many difficult things, which you know I'm sure to do wrong, and then I'm supposed to do substitution anyway. Where is the logic in that? I think, you know, as mathematics teachers, we are duty bound to answer this question. I think she is absolutely right. Why should she not substitute and give this answer? Why do we insist on derivations, knowing very well that you are going to make mistakes during? I mean, look at that question, right? That sin x and it's not something that ordinary adults, you know, or you know, Shaji is a theoretical physicist, right? I mean, it's not something same people would sit and try, you know, unless you have to do it in an exam, right? Or you have a burning need in some particular context, and then you say that no, you have to, and then you say you have to substitute and verify anyway. Now, what are the inference rules employed in school algebra? We have axioms for equal. I mean, this is not how it is taught. I am just pulling it out from the way we do it. This is something that we use all the time. If A equals B and C equals D, then A plus C equals B plus D. You can always add left hand side. You can always add right hand side. You can cross add multiplicativity. You can also multiply. Things are OK. Substitution, if A equals B, you take any expression. For X, you can substitute A, and you can substitute B, and you will get the same thing. They all make sense. But are they adequate? Is it actually enough to do these things to get all correct answers for a trigonometry problem in class 11 or class 12? We are happy because no child actually stops us and asks, if I keep on deriving, deriving left hand side and right hand side like this, am I guaranteed that I will get whatever you are asking me to do? Now, anybody who has spent time doing trigonometric identities in second higher secondary school knows the pain of what I am talking about, right? Unless you have a real, I mean, very often this is something children try. There is an identity that you have to do. Go, keep on manipulating left hand side. Keep on manipulating right hand side in the hope that something will happen and it's. They will come out the same. Of course, it never works. But why doesn't it work? Is this all OK? The action has actually barely begun. What about the following informal rules? Are they heuristics? Or are they actual good rules of inference? We are told, simplify if and when necessary. I am quoting from a textbook. right? Now, this is a beautiful statement in a textbook. How is a child to know? When is simplification necessary? And especially if you write if and when necessary, what am I supposed to do? Equations are one variable. Get all terms containing the variable to one side. This is very important. right? There, is, there are terms involving x on the right hand side, on the left hand side. Bring them together. Add or subtract monomials with like terms only. Make sure that you don't add 5x squared and 8x cubed and get 13x cubed. Right? I mean, you can't do that. 5x squared plus 8x squared, you can add x cubed terms you should not touch. To divide a polynomial by another polynomial, make sure that they are both in descending order and then use long division. I'm quoting from the NCRT book. Is this inference at all? To solve inequalities, proceed exactly like for equality, except that if you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, you must reverse the direction of the inequality sign. Again, we teach this in algebra. For factoring, find the largest common monomial and factor of each term and divide the original polynomial to obtain the second factor. Uh, Krishna Masha is probably not here. I have discussed this with Professor Krishnan uh, many times because the language of algebra that we have uh, in our uh, secondary textbooks, I think, is something that we have to take very seriously because. You know, it doesn't matter whether we write it in Malayalam or Tamil or Hindi or English. The problem is not translations. It's not about mother tongue. It's about a pseudo mathematical language that we start using and what it means for mathematics students. This is, I think, we don't write usually, but actually, it's very important. Look for differences of squares because anytime you find something of the form a squared minus b squared, you can always use a plus b minus. A plus B times A minus B. That works all the time. Now, the procedural conceptual divide, you know, 
following rules as opposed to thinking conceptual is all important in mathematics education. Now, we have presented one set of rules that are easily formalizable in inference rules in a deduction system. The other set of heuristics are really computation rules. Now, there is a deep theorem in logic known as the curry howard isomorphism that says actually both are the same thing. And that you can actually go back and forth between the two. And for mathematics teachers, it can make a lot of difference to know um, these very important theorems. In fact, much of the divide is not mathematical at all. It's pedagogic. And it can help pedagogy. Right? Very often, we have exercises such as, without calculating, answer whether this is true or false. Now, often, student you know, curriculum emphasizes assertions and proofs of assertions. Right? Uh, for instance, if you take the exponential law, the textbook will give detailed uh, proofs. And very often students ask, why should I learn all these things? Because the exercises will not ask me to prove anything. I have to only apply it. I have to only check whether this inequality holds. Now, this is one reason why students often mistakenly resort to examples and explanations. When you ask to prove things, they only give explanations. Right? Now, what is the relationship between proving an assertion and checking that the assertion is true? These are different things. And again, a deep theorem of logic explains the connection, but then you have to even understand what truth means. What does it mean for a sentence to be true? The idea of verifying an assertion is central to computational thinking. When we ask children, primary school children, to divide 20 toffees among 10 children, if you also ask them to verify that all children have been counted and that all toffees have been given, we see the need for verification very early on. Fluency in arithmetical calculations requires an ability to self-check the answer. When students do constructions in geometry, when something goes wrong, same problems surfaces. Statistics, that's a huge problem, especially when you work with a lot of data. Because if you do not self-check what you have done, you can get into very serious problems. Elements of logic can play a useful role all along the school years in this regard. I mean, I am using only algebra examples today for a particular reason. Actually, I can give you examples from number theory, from geometry, from trigonometry. All these things are very similar. Now, until 19th century, geometry was thought to be the assertion of truths derived from premises about the real world seems self-evidently to be true. That is Euclidean geometry. Euclid's axioms and postulates, these are assumptions seen to be true from the real world. We now see, you know, after non-Euclidean geometry came along, we realize that geometry is actually a direction of conclusions from some geometric hypothesis. Does it matter for school mathematics? Yes and no. Now, the notion of truth, right, the notion of counterexample is taken for granted in mathematics. But it's not intuitive. We often consider statements to be true um, if uh, there is overwhelming evidence for it or very little evidence against it. Now, I once did a series of exercises with secondary school children on their use of P implies Q. Their use was frequentist in the sense that implication holds if in most conceivable situations when P is seen to hold, so is Q. Once when I asked, does X greater than Y implied X, X squared greater than Y squared, a student, in fact, a student told me this was both true and false since it was true for half the numbers. Right? It's an interesting assertion, right? Because for positive integers, of course, it's true. In fact, he was talking about integers. And for negative numbers, yes, you know, okay. So now all this is important for teachers to understand, right? In classrooms. Now, the fundamental notion of modern mathematical logic is to distinguish syntax and semantics carefully and unify deduction, which is a syntactic notion, with logical consequence, which is a truth-based notion. For instance, if I ask, is x squared minus 2 equal to 0 true? Well, it depends on what x range is over, right? Because obviously, if x is over integers, this is not true, but over real numbers, it is true, because there is a solution. Is the angle sum property true? That the sum of um, three angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. Depends. 
if you consider triangles on the plane, of course it's true, otherwise it's false. Is multiplication repeated addition? Yes, if you are in primary school. But, you know, root 2 times root 3, you cannot explain using repeated addition. I mean, after all, a field has both addition and multiplication because multiplication cannot be reduced to addition. The notion of truth in models is therefore worthwhile for mathematics educators and teachers to comprehend and appreciate. And the main point I want to make is that students are confused about these things in very different places and mathematics education does not take it seriously and then we say students find it difficult etc etc and uh, yeah so here is a one slide course in mathematical logic Tarski formalized the notion of truth in a structure we can talk about the syntax of a logical language where we can talk about predicates relations etc and then you say and or not and so on and then use quantifiers like for all that exists now this is basically the language of all textbooks you know anything that you write geometry in for instance or calculus mathematical structures like real numbers complex numbers integers graphs you know all these provide semantics or interpretations for these symbols and therefore when i write plus I'm talking about addition over integers, addition over real numbers, addition over complex numbers, and they mean different things. And we can talk about a sentence being true in a structure. Like I said, there exists x such that x squared minus 2 equal to 0. And we can talk about evaluating it over real numbers when it is true, evaluating it over integers when it is false. And if I talk about x squared plus 2 equal to 0, and put a there exists x, it's false over real numbers true over complex numbers, etc. So this is the grand program of logic, arriving at truth through the notion of proof. And uh, thanks to Hilbert and Gödel, in general, you can talk about any structure that makes all assumptions on the left-hand side true, makes right-hand side true also. And this is what is called logical consequence. The main point is that you are quantifying over all possible structures. And therefore, this notion is not something that you can check. So when Mathematicians talk about truth, checking truth in a particular structure, they do not mean the statement. So you have a notion of deduction where you actually do a step-by-step -step derivation. And Gödel's famous theorem, completeness theorem, not incompleteness, shows that these two notions are the same thing when we talk about the quantified logic. And uh, there are many places, I'm not saying that we should teach this in you know, school mathematics. My point is understanding this helps to clarify a lot of confusions and in particular helps math teachers and educators. Because it does not make sense to ask whether a definition is true, but you can ask whether two definitions are equivalent. We can use, you know, clean up the mess with algebra in algebra with the kind of examples that I talked about. Again, this is an exam from a board exam question. Show sine A equals sine B if and only if a plus b equals 2m plus 1 pi or a minus b equals uh, 2, uh, 2m pi. Now, this is a mess, clearly, right? And what are even a and b expressed in radians? And, uh, you know, what is the quantification? And, uh, you know, we do ask such questions in board exams, right? Uniform understanding of solution of equations, arguments for functions, parameters, families of functions, rule-based views of function and then in class 11 you teach them as ordered pairs now all this needs reconciliation now the, the tyranny of the equal symbol in school mathematics right there is extensive literature in math education on the misconceptions that children have on these and on practices but we don't uh, you know i think equality demands very special treatment in teacher education curricula teachers need to understand that equality denotes equivalence relations uh, decimal representations are expressions in formal language, and that's why we object to people writing something like pi equals 22 by 7, right? I mean, it's not. But there are many practical reasons why you want to equate them and use, but that doesn't mean that they are equal, right? And uh, when I write square root of 2 equals 1.414, very similar thing is going on. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, when we write x squared minus 1 equals x plus 1 times x minus 1, 
we are really talking about equivalence of functions from real numbers to real numbers. Both the left hand side and right hand side denote when we interpret them as functions from real numbers to real numbers, then we have to look at what it means when we start doing these operations. And this takes us all the way to limits and equivalence. For instance, 0 0.9999 equals 1. This is not an equality, it's an equivalence. Much of the confusion in differential calculus has logical origins. A student once asked me, how can we write limit extending to 0 sin x by x when we don't know whether the limit exists or not? Right? You ask me to find out whether the limit exists or not, but then how can I even write limit extending to 0 sin x by x? In fact, a worried student once asked whether we should check all the places where limit is given in the book to make sure that limit exists. Now, can you imagine a physics course where you ask the student to check where whenever you have written an integral, that function is actually integrable, right? Come on, we don't do these things, and we should not. I'm only saying that uh, what justifies factorization when division by zero is not allowed, right? What's the language that we are using? What is the notion of reasoning that is going on? If a student asks, whether there is a method to check whether any given function is differentiable at a given point, how should one answer? We are very lucky that our students don't cross question us on these things. In fact, we don't allow room for students to even ask us these questions. So truth in models open our, opens our eyes to uniformity of uh, You are muted. Jump, okay. 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 Sorry, I don't know how did this happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, there are many ideas applicable to Boolean algebras, natural numbers, integers, rationals, reals, at the end, complex numbers. We use the same notation, we use the same kind of structure, but we mean different things as we go along. And students do get uh, into problems because of these. Now, very similar things apply in geometry, and I'm not taking this example because I want to. Uh, the important thing is that there are very nice connections from geometry to trigonometry, which we do not take up at all. We do not explain the connection at all in school. And I think all this is room for logic. I was once interacting with some students on mathematical explorations. Now, Satya was very interested in algebraic exploration. She asked me, I'm only used to showing equations that the book already tells me are equal. What if when I try something new and end up with expressions that are not equal? How will I be able to proceed with that? That's a very reasonable question to ask. I mean, we have ways of doing equations, but we don't know anything about inequalities, right? And especially in algebra. Now, a student who wants to work with expressions and I mean, she was genuinely interested. Uh, basically, what she asked me, she doesn't know the language for this. She's asking, are the, are the rules used for equational reasoning actually also OK for proving inequalities? A beautiful question. Satya is a logician. And this is exactly what logicians do and uh, logicians think about. It's reasonable to ask whether the methods that we use in mathematics classes are reliable. Teachers mostly assume this. A teacher asks, we use only rules for solving equations, for factorization and for so on. How do we know that they are correct? Another asks, in geometry, we only discuss statements that we can prove. How do I know what can be proved when I just look at a statement? Right? We ask students to solve polynomial inequalities over one variable and mark the solution as intervals, right? Very often we do this on the real line. How are we even sure that this is always possible, right? Uh, these are not easy questions to answer. They are all good questions. There is one single answer. Welcome to mathematical logic. In fact, this is something that mathematical logic clarifies very beautifully for you. And here is Alfred Tarski. Um, Tarski proved, you know, Tarski, there is a famous Tarski's high school algebra problem, asked just the same question, completeness for school algebra. 
an equation between polynomials is true if and only if it's provable in equational logic. And uh, Tarski proved this as a theorem, and uh, that's what many of the things that we use in school mathematics depend on. Tarski's proof of decidability of real arithmetic assures us that a set of sa reals satisfying a polynomial inequality can actually be represented as a finite Boolean combination of intervals, which is what we ask students to do in the board exam. But we don't really know why that is true. In fact, the proof of this is very, very useful and a very illuminating proof. In fact, Euclidean geometry is incomplete. But there is an algorithm to check if a given sentence is true in the standard model. In fact, no such algorithm exists for integers. That's Gerdel's famous incompleteness theorem, which later, I mean, it doesn't settle this directly. Alan Turing in 1936 showed that there is no such algorithm. And uh, that algorithm um, for doing this for geometry goes back to one of the great mathematicians of uh, late 19th century, David Hilbert. And uh, these are all beautiful theorems of logic. Knowing all this can help the secondary school teacher not only in gaining conviction in the content, but also make up her own inference rules, ensuring their soundness. I mean, in fact, I would say, especially for secondary, higher secondary teachers and for undergraduate teachers, I think these things can make a huge difference. So let me end with saying that logic really stands outside the school mathematics curriculum. For improving teachers' own understanding of mathematical content in algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus, a short and rigorous introduction to mathematical logic can be of great use. This can be of pedagogic value, especially in bridging the conceptual procedural divide. Does it need a reshaping of curriculum? Can theorem proving tools help? I don't know. But I think it's worthwhile finding out answers to such questions. And aside, propositional reasoning is easy and friendly and uh, can play a useful role in discrete mathematics and computational thinking. And that, again, is an opportunity that's not uh, utilized at all today. That's not central to what I'm saying, but not important for mathematics education. But since uh, computational thinking is becoming very important, and I think that's also something we <coughs> Let me end with uh, quotes from mathematicians that I like very much. Here is David Wheeler. Because mathematics is made by men, not women, I suppose, and exists only in their minds, it must be made or remade in the mind of each person who learns it. In this sense, mathematics can only be learned by being created. And I think this is very important for us mathematics teachers to keep in mind all along. And here is Herman Weyl warning us that logic is the hygiene the mathematician practices to keep his ideas healthy and strong. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jam. Now it's open for discussions. Jam, can I ask a question? See, usually uh, in learning mathematics or physics, we use intuition, right? Not a very formal kind of logic, but that seems to help uh, in understanding things. So, is it I mean formal uh, logic? Is it necessary always? I mean, no, no. I in fact, I don't think. I'm I'm quite against the use of formal logic. Okay. I don't think, you know, it helps. What it does is that, like I tried to say, intuition is about truth, right? Much of our intuition that we use is to say this is true, this is false, right? And formalization helps where there is confusion, right? The point is that intuition um, helps discovery, but it can also lead to points of confusion. In fact, that's why I was showing you what I call legitimate confusion, right? When you reason intuitively, there are many places where you are confused because you should be confused, right? And that is where formalization actually helps. And in mathematics, there are very rigorous ways of answering these questions, right? And uh, learning them actually helps. So the use of, you know, I am against the use of formal derivations and formalism on a routine basis. Especially if you start doing things in a routine way, they just become boring and intuitive and pretty much useless. 
if you can actually directly figure it out why would you sit and bother right but on the other hand wherever there are contradictions wherever there are problems of this kind then you know there you have to rely on formalization and in fact that's how the you know we talk about process of science right there is a process of mathematics in mathematical processes formalization invariably comes because you can catch inconsistency and uh, mathematicians in fact talk in very informal language when mathematicians work you know one of the be best kept secrets from math students is that mathematicians don't do proofs right when you are doing mathematics you are always looking for counter examples it is when you make conjectures and you look for counter examples when you find there are fewer and fewer counter examples you start looking for proofs even then you are looking for proof strategies proof is a final thing the written proof is something for communicating for publication whatever it's not part of the process of doing at all right but then that formalism is very important because it helps you detect your own inconsistency right and quite a lot of the thing is about guarding against inconsistency and i think that is where a lot of the work really comes one of the problems that i have found in maths textbooks at least uh, i consider it as a problem they don't give any idea of uh, how this idea came up i mean they don't give any absolute history yeah so that's also needed now yeah. at least in physics books some books will tell you how i mean what are the experiments done what are the contradictions and what they started thinking about yeah. i mean that's of course uh, and, and and that's a very big problem there are some questions in the next Can you see it? Uh, one moment. Ah. Uh, do you think we are missing the proper steps to ensure smooth translations of logic in our curriculum? If not, what do we miss? So just a few books that are good introduction. Oh, yeah. They're both are very important and essential uh, things. One is um, um, what is missing, right? Uh, logic in our curriculum. Yeah. What is missing is especially and like i said in my opinion uh, the language used in the textbook is a it's not clear b it it is over precise in a pseudo precise sense actually right the important thing is that you don't actually accept the places where there is confusion and give you know explanations when you give rules you don't say this rule you know you don't talk about limitations of rules so one part is in textbook writing right and explaining or guide books or and we don't have teachers handbooks which is a major problem because uh, secondary school teachers or higher secondary teachers have only the textbook and don't have any ways of uh, you know anything on pedagogy so that's a problem second thing is that when we teach algebra or geometry we do not spend time on the inference process at all what is the kind of reasoning that is actually happening i told you it shoved into the appendix right i mean that's not something that we take seriously on the other hand I, what i would like to argue is that we need to reduce the content we don't need to do this uh, 2000 examples on the, what i showed you with uh, uh, sin x and root x and uh, uh, in uh, you know evaluation of so many limits and derivatives but on the other hand we have to show many more examples of reasoning get children to actually understand the reasoning that is going on so uh, what i am trying to say is not introduce logic as a subject it is not about introducing some chapters but learning enough logic so that first you know we can introduce reasoning at various places where it is relevant address children's questions and be able to answer them this is what i am advocating and i think in terms of points in the curriculum i can actually point out i mean i was showing examples from algebra but equally well we can show examples from other content areas of mathematics as well uh in terms of books yeah uh i think uh, in terms of on, on mathematical logic perhaps i the best one that i would recommend is uh, enderton's book in uh, uh in terms of uh, yeah I, I you know i can uh, maybe post some on uh, uh, 
uh, there are very many uh, important and uh, interesting textbooks in mathematics uh, in logic that are actually written for uh, this kind of uh, you know in a general sense uh, schoenfield's book on mathematical logic is a classic and i think uh, i would strongly recommend there is uh, for mathematics teachers there is uh, especially second middle school secondary school teacher there is a book by kastner uh, which is actually called role of language in mathematics teaching and uh, she talks about the algebraic language and problems with it and so on uh, if there is some place where i can send the a list of suggestions i would be happy to do that uh, maybe luca or somewhere i can post it yeah. there is a question on uh, yeah reasoning is left out of mathematics text certainly it is left out i mean it's there in some few places but uh, not good enough and if it is all about and and or and implies you are not going to yeah uh, yen stewart's books are very good to read they are like you know popular expositions but i'm not sure that it teaches you logic directly at least i have not read but uh, yeah computer science we use boolean algebra to handle logic is there any other mathematical method that can be used by computer science to handle logic uh, now in uh, i was referring more to um, when we teach programs when we teach programming right in high secondary level we do not find any way to talk about the correctness of the program right how are i mean students do right in uh, class 12 there are many number theoretic uh, questions that we ask I write a you know i don't know java program to check whether a number is a perfect number or not right now this kind of there are many such as this is given but students have no way of checking whether their program works and uh, no way of arguing that their program is actually doing the correct thing right and uh, this is where logic can play a big role uh, boolean algebra is only about teaching boolean algebra i'm not even sure we need to teach so much boolean algebra to learn computer the main point is that they do a lot of programming but there is no you know notion of program correctness at all program correctness is all about logic that that's the right place we introduce logic but that we don't even have it in undergraduate class let alone high school it used to be taught that way like i said in the 90s but uh, by now we have given up on that any other <coughs> hello uh, hello sir thank you so much actually it's a very nice talk but i couldn't uh, attend it uh, but uh, thank you so much because uh, i am a physics student right uh, but uh, from my childhood like uh, i don't have a very good mathematics teacher like you because someone who is talking about uh, mathematics uh, is actually great because i was uh, very fond of mathematics as a physics student but uh, is that is there any way uh, how do you get into uh, uh, the discussion with the uh, like they, the teachers have to address the logic of students uh, uh, in pedagogy right yeah. uh, guiding the governments to meet the teachers You know, to have this uh, addressing logic uh, in is that any way like uh, any way that can be introduced in the guide the students to mathematics? Yeah, because yeah. that is more essential because you are you what you are talking about logic that I don't know because I am not a math student. But yeah, yeah. What, no. Yeah, what so, you are talking is so so essential. So. Uh, millions and millions of students are missing this part so they are uh, fearing about mathematics including myself so can you do something on this yeah no this is very important and uh, we have to do something on this uh, the question is about who is to do what and uh, i think uh, see one major problem is that uh, for primary school and middle school we have uh, for teachers there is a lot of uh, so called teacher training right i mean some amount of uh, in service training goes on with uh, you know uh, what is service shiksha abhiyan now it's called samagra shiksha there are various uh, programs but for secondary level higher secondary level there is very little i have myself attended uh, and spoken in 
programs organized by SCRT Kerala. Uh, but uh, most of them, I mean, there are very nice problem solving sessions, but uh, most of them are about uh, particularly, uh, you know, content areas. That's very important. Problem solving. We very rarely get to pedagogy. I mean, especially of the kind of pedagogical questions Dr. Selvarani is raising right now. Uh, we don't discuss mathematics. I mean, mathematics pedagogy largely, I see, is confined to discussions at the primary school and the middle school, if at all. Mostly primary school. There's so much work on math pedagogy at primary school. I'm afraid on secondary, higher secondary, there's almost very little in the country. In the country in general, I would say. But uh, certainly, you know, uh, we need to do a lot more. And I think, uh, I think we all have to knock on the doors of uh, the government to take this seriously and institute programs and do more of I think this should come as a demand from teachers. I think. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, but uh, I think uh, one person uh, from mathematics talking about understanding the students' mind is you. Uh, really, I feel so happy that uh, so far I I'm a physics professor as now. Uh, but uh, till now, uh, because I'm searching for mathematics professor for so long, uh, to tell me all the physical media for the mathematical steps that we are taking in all the derivations. And then I started digging uh, on myself on my own. So now I am okay with my mathematics, mathematical physics and that uh, mathematical part of physics. But uh, largely, uh, I think even the physics students and mathematics students, they do the exact physical meaning or the logic behind each and every step that what we are doing. So, uh, is there any way that you can have a series of lectures like this? Can we connect it with this uh, kind of aspects exclusively for this session? Is it possible with your organization or something? I just want to know. We, we can see. Yeah, we can see. We can always try. Thank sure. Yeah, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Uh, sir, this is conversation. Shall I? Ah, yes. Yes, Miss. Yes, sir. Yes, <laughs> Really, you know about me very well, and I'm yeah, really I'm not, I'm actually a child in this forum uh, because I'm not much about uh, now uh, knowing mathematics. So I know only about the Sudoku uh, creations and all. Whether uh, my question wait, is before here you, before you go on, I must I don't know people know Kumarasan well. I must introduce Kumarasan to this group. Uh, he's uh, he works on railway locomotives. He's uh, he drives trains. Right? Yes, a pilot, pilot, yeah. He's a pilot, and uh, people don't know. And and he's a great mathematics enthusiast. He's internationally known for Sudoku competitions. He co conducts them. He designs. He creates Sudokus. One of the most creative persons. It has been my fortune to know through all the science movement. And uh, yeah, so I think PSM is the right place for this to have a trained pilot talking to us about mathematics. Yes, Kumaresan, please. <laughs> yes, sir, can you put, please put on your video? We can see your face. Um, actually, the lights are very rare because I'm no. sitting in my uh, rooms where I'm okay. just in the open place where the light is very little. Okay, fine. So, okay. If, yes, yeah. yeah. Now we can see you, Kumaresan. Great. Yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> Thanks for your introduction, sir. Actually, uh, my question is here, uh, to attract the students towards this logic and mathematics, whether we can introduce uh, the type of logic games like a Sudoku. There is a lot of uh, things, uh, right? because the people know only the Sudoku, the numbers which is from 1 to 9 to be placed no. within this box and all. Simply the people who know through the newspapers. But uh, there is a lot of places, lot of things we can do it in uh, by introducing so many variants. Uh, which is SARS also know very well about like killers, even diagonal, so many things. But by introducing that type of games to the uh, in the curriculum, so that the people, because the the uh, the students are aware maybe in that time, if you introduce in the way of playing or a game, the people will attract to, to uh, do something like this. So if we introduce that type of the thing in the work curriculum, whether it can improve the understanding of the logic or the mathematics or in something like that, I am not able to. No, no, uh, it's not a uh, question. Express. You yes. know my answer to it. The answer is a big, loud yes, yes, yes. I mean, we must do. I think logic games are extremely important. Uh, you know how enthusiastic I am about uh, Sudoku and its role in this. And I think you know Sudoku is a wonderful example of a logic game, and it's great that it's very popular. There are many logic games, and games are the really the way to go. 
and uh, it's a great way. In fact, I have even given a lecture on probabilistic reasoning using Sudoku's. You know, yes. so you can you know equation solving using Sudoku's. So there is a lot that we can do. And unfortunately, these are things that you know people like you do. In general, we don't take seriously enough. And I am very happy that you have said this because pe people science movement, in my opinion, must take mathematics much, much more seriously. I mean, we do so much work on science education. I mean, experiments are very important and all that, but we don't do, you know, even a f very small fraction of that when it comes to use of logic games, math games in general. And I think uh, I'm very happy that uh, Kumaration has pointed this out. We need to do a lot more on that. <laughs> I am always ready, sir, to, to share about my experience and creations to this type of thing if it is going to the in the form of Definitely. curriculum. Definitely. Yes, sir. We have we are already we have a forum, Logic Process India, which is representing uh, World Puzzle Federation. Yeah. Uh, why don't and, you put uh, that uh, Logic Puzzles India site on the chat? Yes, yeah, sir, definitely. I'll put all the IDs. Uh, someone also asking about the IDs. So I'll put it here. And if even if you IDs, sir, sir, want to know, sir, definitely I'll share all the things. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. Yes, definitely. So thank you uh, once again. Yes, thank you very much to you and to all. Thank you. Jam, I think you are the email at the ID. There is a Yeah, so I think uh, maybe you can link to the Logic Puzzles India as well as Luca. I think this will be something that. Jam, can you see a new question from Naveen Kumar in the oh, comment sorry, box? Sorry, I didn't see that. Uh, does mathematical communication have a role in developing mathematical logic abilities? I mean, this is chicken and egg, right? I mean, uh, um, Developing logic abilities helps you communicate better, and doing more on communication helps you logic better. So I think uh, these are all things that go hand in hand. But in general, you know, your point is very important for math education in general, because mathematical communication is not something that we take seriously. Reading mathematics, writing mathematics is, I think, very important. And uh, if we actually train our children to write mathematics much more, not so much worry about just you know finding answers to questions and correct answer, right answer thing. About real equality of writing, talking mathematics. In fact, I have always said that the most important thing, especially we talk about fear of mathematics and so on. Anybody who talk you know talks mathematics is never afraid of you know you never you are never afraid of things that you talk about. So I, you know, like I said, there are great teachers here like P.K. Ramchandran and so on. So you know who know get students to talk mathematics all the time. So I think uh, it's once that happens, you know, formal communication, all this comes. So as always with language, spoken language is first, written language is later. 